Good morning, everybody. I am Pastor Daniel, pastor here at the McCordsville United Methodist Church. I want to welcome you all to worship here today. It is good to be in the house of the Lord. Amen? Amen. 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 Our hope and our prayer is that through this time of worship that we all will be touched by God, that we would all encounter the risen Christ, and in that encounter be set upon the path that he is calling us to go down. Amen? Amen. Amen. Well, it is birthday Sunday, so if you had a birthday in the month of September, we will have our collection this morning, and again, this is a missional collection that goes to a children's home. I do have some very important tidbits to share with you. Uh, one of those is during the month of October, we as a church will be collecting socks for kids. Uh, you will find a box down by the fellowship hall that we'll have out next week. But through the entire month of October, we will be collecting socks for kids. This is actually a connection to one of the vendors that we had at this year's Lord's Acres. So we thought it'd be kind of cool to be able uh, to continue that relationship and, and join in on this mission to help uh, get socks for kids. So the month of October. And speaking of Lord's Acre, again, want to thank you all for making this year's Lord's Acre what it was. It was a wonderful time. I'm still recovering from the fried fish and hush puppies. But yes, it was wonderful as wonderful. Also, following today's first service here, we will have a brief ad council uh, to go over uh, uh, 2022's budget for charge conference purposes. And with that, let us stand this morning for our call to worship, Majesty. Majesty, worship his majesty unto Jesus be all glory, honor, and praise. Majesty. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, during this time of worship, we pray that you, by your Holy Spirit, would do a work of grace within all of our hearts, within all of our minds, within all of our lives. Father, we pray that through this time of worship that we would raise your name, that we would make your name great, that we would be glorifying your name, that as we're praying, that as we're hearing your word, that as we're singing, that worship would just flow. Father, today we pray that during it all that you would place us all upon your potter's will and that you would mold us and shape us into the people that God, that you are calling us to be. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Let's continue singing by singing a hymn, Grace Greater Than Our Sin. <clears throat> mm -hmm. 
Marvelous grace of our loving Lord, grace that exceeds our sin and our guilt. Yonder on Calvary's mount outpoured, there where the blood of the Lamb was spilled. Would you please join me in the Apostles' Creed? I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. I tell you, it was just wonderful hearing everyone sing, wasn't it, Tim? Just wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. Yes, indeed. This morning, do we have any joys? Do we have any joys that we'd like to share with one another? Some good news, good news. Not prayer concerns yet, joys, yes. Granddaughter got her doctor's degree. That is awesome. That is great news, Dee. Yes, indeed. Any other joys? Any other joys that we'd like to share with one another? Any other joys? It is feeling like fall. That is definitely good news in September. Yes, indeed. Yes, Jeannie? Yeah, we got her confirmation. She graduated um, from college on April 
That is great. Jolie got confirmation that she graduates on the 18th of December this year. That is wonderful news. Yes, indeed. And what a journey the last year and a half has been for her in college. I would only imagine. <laughs> yes, indeed. Any other joys? Yes. <laughs> I'm sure the last bar bit will definitely help his diabetes. Yes, indeed. I love it. Thank you, Dee, for that. Uh, Debbie just uh, shared that Bob Van Cleve, um, he had been going through some testing, and the good news is, is they found that he does not have Parkinson's. That is wonderful news. But apparently he has not been attending to his diabetes well, and that has to change immediately. Yes, indeed. Anything else? Anything else? Any prayer concerns? Prayer, or, yes, Jan? Jan Smith's dad is out of the hospital and is in rehab. Also do have an update on Don Barney. Don Barney is also out of the hospital and also is in um, a rehab, a, a nursing facility for just a few more days, maybe another week, but then should be going home. Yes, indeed. Any other prayer concerns? Yeah, Corey? Definitely. Prayers for the family of Bob Williams that passed a week or so ago um, with his battle with cancer. Definitely prayers for Bob and his family. Yes. Definitely prayers for... Oh, man. The Beasley family, uh, both of the parents had uh, passed uh, within, you said, mi minutes, hours, hours uh, from COVID and uh, passed holding each other's hand. And uh, definitely prayers for the entire family and friends and loved ones. Absolutely. Absolutely. Any other prayer concerns? You're right there in the middle. Yeah, I can imagine. How many years did she play the organ here at the church? 40? Yeah. At least 40. Uh, Carolyn just gave us an update on Don and Regina Bowen, and uh, they're on the hunt for a church, but I have not been able to find one that uh, I think sort of reminds them of their home church here. So yeah, definitely, definitely. But prayers for them, and it's good to hear that they're doing well. Anything else? Prayers for Wilby's brother. He's out of the hospital, but in a nursing facility. All right. Yes, there in the middle. Max Bennett and his family. Definitely continued prayers. Yes. Oh, someone came up to me before church today, and he said he had a prayer concern, and uh, he looked awfully serious at me, and he said the man's last name happens to be Wentz. <laughs> Catch it? Thought you'd appreciate that, Tam. Carson Wentz, the quarterback of the Colts, for the rest of us that are going, who on earth is Wentz? <laughs> yes. Well, let's pray together. Father, this morning we just come before you recognizing your word to be true. And your word tells us, Lord, that you, Jesus, are the same today, yesterday, and forever. So, Lord, today we reach out to you just like folks reached out to you in the Gospels, asking for healing in the lives of our loved ones. We pray for those that are battling cancer. And we pray, God, for today that there would be renewed strength. And we also pray that, God, that you would continue to work your healing through the doctors, the nurses, and all those that would be caring for them on their behalf. 
Lord, this day we pray for those families, those people, those individuals in our community that are outside of a relationship with your son. We pray that we as a church would be a catalyst, would be a bridge for that relationship to take place, to happen. A relationship that would last not just this lifetime, but for an eternity. Father, for us as a congregation, we give you again the utmost praise for last weekend's Lord's Acre. We thank you, God, for seeing us through. We thank you, God, for having have built that hedge of protection around us. And we thank you, God, for the continued blessings that we hear from those that attended. Father, this day we pray for us as a congregation. And we ask that, God, that you would just renew within us a passion and commitment to the mission of building your kingdom. And now, Lord Jesus, we pray the prayer that you taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. I'm finding myself at a loss for words and the funny thing is it's okay last thing I need is to be heard but to hear what you would say word of God speak would you pour down like rain washing my eyes to see your majesty to be still and know that you're in this place please let me stay
Thank you, Tim. Thank you, Tim. Beautiful song, and uh, I still am amazed at this sound system that Corey and the crew had put in. It sounded beautiful, done wonderfully. Just thank you, thank you. Amen, church? Amen. Well, today's message is entitled, The Breastplate of Righteousness. It will come from Ephesians chapter 6, verse 14, and also Jude 17 through 21. If mama ain't happy, ain't no one happy. And my mama that I believe is watching us via live stream ain't happy that I've used the word ain't four times already in this sermon. My mom was a first grade teacher for much of my growing up life. And when I'd use the wonderful word of ain't, she would correct me, say ain't isn't a word. I've checked. It is in the dictionary. Oh, but I kid. Let's take this for another spin. We all know what it's like for the house to fall into disarray. Having three kiddos at the parsonage is as if one can simply blink their eyes and our house appears as if Tasmanian devils have just made passes through all of the rooms. Toys here, coffee cups there, controllers over yonder, Tupperware all over the kitchen floor, bottles of water rolling around the tile, the lids from the second drawer from the floor, I wonder who got into that, scattered throughout. Sarah, when she comes home from work sometimes, she will just take a gander at all the chaos around the home and ask, what on earth did you do today, Daniel? My response, I kept the children alive, honey. They're clearly alive. <laughs> Again, I kid. But the truth of the matter is, when our home looks as if a preschool has erupted, like small little volcanoes known as Emily, Carter, Luke, and <clears throat> Daniel have erupted, it don't take long for mama to grow unhappy. And when mama grows unhappy, the saying that has stood the test of time for a reason rings true. No one is happy. But, oh man, the way to even on the cusp of a mama bear rampage to make mama happy is to quite simply and very quietly, without being told is key, to pick up it's amazing the good mood that can wash over mama over sarah when all we do as the preschool song says clean up clean up and i'm not going to attempt to sing it everybody everywhere clean up clean up everybody do your our share and i just quoted barney in a sermon but when we do our share, when we do our part, when we carry our own share of the load, is the Peyton household a happy place indeed? The old saying, when mama isn't happy, no one is happy. Well, it contains within it a truth that we have just humorously explored. In the realm of our relationship with mom, when that relationship is in disarray, our world, our home as we know it, is also in disarray. Relationships in life have a way of bringing balance, of bringing stability, and bringing meaning to our lives. They grant to our lives depth in which we can sink the roots of our lives within. We were created by God to be relational beings. We were never intended to live in isolation, cut off from one another, cut off from friends and family. When we live so, with no real active relationships, even if we are introverted, we, along with our house and our world, crumble. But when our relationships in life are intact, when communication is flowing, when there are no wrongs being held against one another, and we are in harmony with those we live and live in our community with, happiness just has a way of abounding. But when there's unresolved conflict, when those powerful words of, I'm sorry, have yet to be spoken, when communication has turned into the Sahara Desert, when neglect defines the once meaningful, the most of meaningful of relationships, then the world around us becomes a dark and lonely and gloomy sort of place, somehow riddled with hurts and riddled with offense, riddled with all things that truly make us, and not just mama, unhappy. 
You know, the other day I was thinking about relationships when they are broken, how that can cause conflicts to splinter throughout the rest of our home or house or world. How when the supposed to be meaning granting, stability inclining, relationships of our lives, how when they are broken, how the rest of our world mirrors in many ways that brokenness. Well, a particular relationship in a galaxy far, far away came to mind. Luke and Anakin Skywalker. For those not galaxy inclined, Anakin happens to be Luke's father, Darth Vader. <gasps> I know, spoiler alert. <clears throat> Even those that have not watched in its glorious entirety the Star Wars saga most know the famous line, Luke, I am your father. I've tried this on my son many times and I've never gotten the response that Luke in the movie gave his dad. No! I'm waiting for when he's not just 19 months old but 19 years old that it'll probably work rather well then. But the fractured relationship of son and father of Luke and Darth Vader so illustrates this truth that when our relationships are in tatter and tatters, the world around us suffers. Imagine if Darth Vader and Luke had been reconciled all those years ago. How many lives would have not suffered the Empire's fate? I'm thinking of you, Mr. Death Star, and the destruction of Alderaan. Hmm. It's as if the brokenness of Anakin, Darth Vader's life, and Padawan's death and a separation of his hidden away kids were projected upon all the Empire's enemies. Darth Vader wasn't happy. And guess what? No one in the galaxy was happy. Well, this same truth can be applied to bosses, to community leaders, to HOAs, to neighborhoods, you name it. When our relationships are healthy and intact, we in our house are that much more healthy and intact. When our relationships are in disarray, we in our house are that much more also in disarray. Which brings us to our passage this morning. And why don't we stand together for this portion of the reading of God's word. It happens to be Jude. 17 through 21. But you must remember, beloved, the predictions of the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ. They said to you, in the last time, there will be scoffers following their own ungodly passions. It is these who cause divisions, worldly people devoid of the Spirit. But you, beloved, building yourselves up in your most holy faith and praying in the Holy Spirit, keep yourselves in the love of God waiting for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ that leads to eternal life let's pray together Lord Jesus in this continued time of preaching and teaching we pray that every word that is spoken and every word that is heard is straight from your heart we pray that you use this time to challenge us to inspire us to fill us back up to transform us and all God's people said, amen, amen. Maybe seated, maybe seated. Bit of an unexpected non-Ephesians curveball, anyone? Yeah. Worry not, eventually we shall see how this passage connects directly to our next piece of the armor of God, the breastplate of righteousness. This passage of Jude points to the relationship of all relationships our relationship to God in and through Christ. Right at the heart, Jude pointed out this relationship. Of all the relationships that we should ensure with every ounce of grace that our God has so lavishly poured within and upon us should ensure remains healthy and intact is that of our relationship with God. All of our other meaningful relationships and the amount of balance, stability, meaning, and depth that they bring, none holds a candle to how our lives will shine if our relationship with God is whole and healthy. The opposite is also true, though. 
When a relationship with God is in shambles. When a relationship with God is broken. When a relationship with God has unresolved conflict, sin. How the rest of our lives are riddled with uncertainty, insecurity, and unstable footing. It's as if everything gets all wonky. Things bother us more than they should. And life just feels cluttered and somehow out of sync. When we and Christ are not in that thriving relationship that he so desires for us to be in. I love the following quote by E. Stanley Jones. He says, When I met Christ, I felt that I had swallowed sunshine. Hmm. And as we are in a healthy relationship with Christ, that sunshine just continues to rise anew each and every glorious morning. Not over some horizon and some distance, but over and within our hearts. And my Aunt Crystal, she loves to go on walks of a morning. She regular, regularly shares pictures of the sunrises that she encounters of a morn. Where she lives out there in Kansas, her view is not obstructed by buildings and city landscape. Oh, no. Of a morn, that sun rises over the horizon in full glorious view. When our relationship with Christ is intact, is healthy, is thriving as it should, such sunrises occur within our lives, within our hearts, within the context of our world. But when that relationship Due to the distractions of life, due to us not doing our Barney share, due to neglect, due to misorganized priorities, due to mismanaged schedules, due to filling our lives with too many good things, due to there no longer being room for God in our day, then what we swallow of a morning, well, isn't the glorious sunshine, the still dark night. But just as St. John the cross's dark night of the soul so reveals, all hope is not lost. For even in the darkest of times, Christ's ever-shining light can expel the darkness and bring within us a new dawn. The how? Well, it's just like it is with our other relationships in this life. We make amends, repentance. We reprioritize, recommit. We do our share, respond to the grace of God shown. And we thus return to, as Jude so beautifully penned, we return to keeping ourselves in the love of God. Way back when, when Methodism was growing and thriving in the lands, good Mr. John Wesley, he penned three simple rules that he believed should define and guard us all as Christians that are Methodists. The first was quite simply, do no harm. It's pretty simple. Do no harm. <laughs> the second, do good. I'm liking this. I can follow this. I can repeat this, just like Jim Turney's Grow With God at the end of the church, right? And the third, which in my mind is truly how we fulfill the other two, is to stay in love with God. I think Wesley, like St. Paul, the apostle to the Gentiles, Paul, the writer of, here comes Ephesians, I think they understood something. That the best defense that we have in this life against the encroaching tendencies and ideologies of the world and the best defense against the wiles and schemes of the devil, temptation, backsliding, and growing cold in our love for God and thus having the defense needed to stay happy is a right and healthy relationship with him. It says John Stott penned, Certainly, no spiritual protection is greater than a righteous relationship with God. To have been justified by his grace through simple faith in Christ crucified, to be clothed with a righteousness which is not one's own but Christ's, to stand before God, not condemned, but fully and completely accepted. This is an essential defense against an accusing conscience 
and against the slanderous attacks of the evil one. The best offense is a good defense, right? I hope Frank Reich is listening. And not just defense as we traditionally think about it, but I'm looking at you, offensive line. I'm looking at you. Oh. But the best offense is a good defense. When we, when our relationships are healthy and intact, as in a relationship with friends and families and coworkers and relatives, you name it, then it's just as if life is just that much more manageable. It's as if that we are just that much more able to handle the curveballs and all the Murphy laws of life. It's as if we're meant to be living life, not as solo artists, not as commandos, but in the context and protection of community. And we, with the support of one another, we can handle so much more than if we were just left to deal with it alone. Add into this gambit a thriving relationship, an intact relationship with Christ. And then we have not just other people to aid us and us them, but we have the divine, the almighty God, the most powerful being in existence, the one whom defeated death with us to handle together what ever life will attempt to lurch at us. This is the best defense and therefore the best possible path to wholeness, healthiness, for what we all desire, happiness. It makes me think of a quote I stumbled across the other day. That's very simple. A leader is only as good as their team. While applied a bit differently, the truth therein remains. We are only as good, only as stable, only as able to deal with life well as the team, as the community that surrounds us. Take a quarterback. If a quarterback is ever to be the best in the league, they're going to need a solid team that surrounds them. A quarterback alone can't win a single game. If he has no offensive line, if he has no receivers, if he has no tight ends, no center, that quarterback is going to be utterly useless on the field. But you surround a quarterback with a solid team, a solid line, with receivers that seem to have glue on their hands, and you have yourself a Super Bowl ring. The same idea applies to our lives. When we are living in healthy community. When we are surrounded by a solid team, that is surrounded by healthy relationships, and now when our relationship with our coach is healthy, Jesus, then we in this life have ourselves a Super Bowl ring. For us, that is, we have ourselves wholeness, stability, depth, meaning. All things that lend themselves to genuine happiness. But what about our armor? Paul penned this idea of staying in love with God, of being in a healthy relationship with God through the phrase, breastplate of righteousness. It's Ephesians 6.14. Stand therefore, having fastened on the genuine leather belt of truth, and having put on the breastplate of righteousness. For Paul the Apostle, his use of the word righteousness is often used to mean justified, as in we through Christ, through simple faith, through grace, are justified before God and thus brought into a right, and I'd add thriving, relationship with him. That is to say, Paul believed that it was through simple faith in Jesus that all that which Jesus accomplished in his life, death, and resurrection is made a reality in our lives. He believed that we, through Jesus, have the same relationship with the Father that he does. It's all Romans 3. See, prior to this work of grace, we were all separated, estranged from God. We are pre-Jesus, as Adam and Eve were, kicked out of the garden 
and not in an intact, healthy, and whole relationship with the Most High. Pre-faith in Jesus, our relationship with God was akin to those other broken relationships that we've all had in this life, where communication broke down, where there was an unhealthy distance between us and them, which caused the rest of our lives just to be off kilter. But through God's grace, amends through faith and repentance on our part can be made. We can truly be brought back into an Adam and Eve pre-fall-like relationship with God. God has already issued his side of us being so. He's done what is needed for us to be brought together again, the cross. It's now up to us to accept what Christ has done and thus make the needed amends for our sins. This breastplate of righteousness is the piece of armor that embodies this core Christian truth. And it is, as Stott said, the best possible line of defense that we have in this life. Just as our lives are more stable, healthy, and whole, when our relationships are stable, healthy, and whole, so again is it with us and then some with Christ. So then the question comes around as to how. How do we ensure this relationship stays whole, healthy, and intact? Well, it's in a way just like how we in the Peyton household keep Mama happy. Here comes Barney again. Clean up, clean up. Everybody, everywhere. Clean up, clean up. Everybody, say it with me. Do your share. Uh, come again? Wesley believed that the way for us to stay in love with God was for us to do our share by attending to all of the ordinances of God. Come again? Huh? Reuben goes on to explain. Ordinance is a strange word to our ears, but to John Wesley, it was a word to describe the practices that kept the relationship between God and humans vital, alive, and growing. He names public worship, like here today, the Lord's Supper next week, private and family prayer, searching the scripture, Bible study, I would add Sunday school, and fasting as essential to a faithful life. Ordinances may be better expressed through Vital relational practices between us and God. In our home, us doing our share, vital relational practices, is for us to pick up the clutter. It's to throw the laundry, not inches from the laundry pail in the bathroom, but actually in the pail itself. It's like basketball, you know, you're kind of shooting, you know, you don't, you, but you make sure it goes in, right? It's not it's not horseshoes, you know? Anybody follow me on that? It, it seems like it's like a universal thing that clothes just gather around the laundry you know, basket. I don't know. After a meal, we help put the food away and clean the dishes. Uh, us doing our share in the Peyton household is when Sarah comes home from a day's work, have dinner going, food smoking on the grill. For us doing our share in the Peyton household, it's us being very intentional and doing our part in the home. These vital practices make the Peyton household a very happy place indeed. With us and God, it's us being intentional, doing our share in our relationship with and to him. Intentional about worship, about gathering with the body of Christ and worshiping from our core him, raising his name above every possible name, glorifying him from the depths of our being. Worship. It's also us cracking open that good book, Bible study, searching the scriptures, not waiting for next Sunday to be the next time you read scriptures. 
to making it a practice of your life. Think of it like food. How long could you go without a meal? Me? Maybe four hours. <laughs> Think about our life in the spiritual sense. How long have you starved yourself? And then wondered why you feel so distant from God. If I'm running on E for too long, I just get hangry. <laughs> Imagine our spiritual lives. How long, at times, we force ourselves to live on E. Prayer. Not just prayers about God intervening in the life of the sick. But prayers and where, again, we bring celebrations to him. Where we intercede on the behalf of friends and neighbors, our country. And it's as if prayer just has a way of dialing our hearts and our lives into him. Having our will become closer to his will. Devotions. There's all sorts of devotions. It's like a snack in the midst of the day. Oswald Chambers, classic, my utmost for his highest. Jesus Calling. Timothy Keller has some great ones. Last but not least, us doing our share. Actively living out our faith through Christian service. Jesus said, when you serve the least of these, you serve me. You want to encounter Christ? Go feed some people. Help some people. Clothe some people, and you will be feeding and clothing him. Reuben goes on and talking about these ordinances that I've dubbed vital relational practices and saying this. It is in these practices that we learn to hear and respond to God's direction. It's in these practices that we learn to trust God as revealed in Christ. It is in these practices that we learn of God's love for us. It is where our love for God is nurtured and sustained. Incorporating these practices in our way of living will keep us in love with God and assure us of God's love for us in this world and the world to come. I couldn't think of anything better to be clothed with than that. I couldn't think of anything better to be clad with than that. And that's why it's the best sort of defense that we can have in this life. You couple that with other healthy relationships, and we are ironclad and on our way to a life of genuine happiness. In closing, let me say, don't let your relationship with God become like Anakin's relationship with Luke. Don't live your life with mama not happy. Don't let the world around you crumble and the people around you suffer because you've not done your share in the realm of your relationships. For when our relationships are whole and healthy, when we've done what we can to ensure by the grace of God that we are where we need to be with them and God, then, then we will be the best versions of ourselves possible. Stable. Balanced. Whole. Happy. We'll be living out our days as a perpetual sunrise. Let's sing our closing hymn together and stand as we sing Onward, Christian Soldiers. Onward, Christian Soldiers Marching as to war with 
with the cross of Jesus going on before Christ the royal master leads against the foe forward into soldiers marching as to war if the cross of Jesus going on before onward then ye people join our happy with a word of prayer together. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, we pray that you would continually, day by day, clad us with your belt of truth and your breastplate of righteousness. We pray that day by day that we would do our share and respond to this grace of you cladding us, girding us with the truth that you are. And all God's people said, Amen. Because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Because he lives, all fear is gone. Because I know he holds a just because he lives. And the words of our good friend, Mr. Jim Turney. Continue with love and forgiveness also as we grow. Continue with love and forgiveness also as we grow with God. Amen. Be safe. See you all next time. Look out for each other. Take care and God bless.